Okay, welcome to the third and final portion of the video recording of my presentation of the slides for the DARPA case discussion and the concepts of the essence of strategy and the idea of focus and trade-offs as the core of strategy. Just uh, if you haven't seen the first two videos, I obviously would encourage you to look at those uh, before you look at this one. Um, but that said, just to review, the basic question that we're trying to do is understand the remarkable success of DARPA as a research organization. And so we've been applying the concepts, we've been sort of systematically going through the concepts of the three latest concept readings in the course, and then applying them to DARPA, you know, sort of bullet point by bullet point, okay, well, how does it apply to DARPA? Um, and we actually, at this point, so we had these three readings, we had the What is Strategy reading, which was actually assigned for the previous discussion on the cores, uh, brewing, cores in the brewing industry, and the two new shorter readings, somewhat simpler readings, I guess, this week, with the DARPA case study, where the perils of bad strategy, and can you say what your strategy is? Well, we've actually, you know, the elements of a good strategy were articulated in each of those readings. The perils of bad strategy, talked about the kernel of a good strategy. The can you say what your strategy is article, talked about the elements of strategy statement. Right? And each of them had sort of the why, where, what, and how elements as at being at the, the key elements, if you will, of a strategy statement or of a strategy more generally. Actually, so we've already gone through all of those and applied them to DARPA. And we then said, okay, well, that's in doing so, we've actually also gone through most of the bullet points. The first three we went through, actually the first four we went through with our last week with the Coors case discussion. And we've just now, of course, the origin, the section of the article by Porter called the Origin of Strategic Positions is really about scope choice. We talked about in the context of we talked about scope with these other two. But we've left the last two bullets. And these are actually, like I said, the core, the whole point of the class, right? Uh, the core of the DARPA class, or the, the, the key insight, is about how trade-offs and focus are at the essence of strategy. Right? And the idea here, first, let's hear from Michael Porter. In that article, What is Strategy, he says, strategy about making trade-offs. The essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. And I highlighted that in the article. You know, and I posted the highlighted version online. Right? And I emphasized extensively, right? You know, I think I even, if I'm looking at it, actually annotated it and wrote the most important lesson in the entire article. But it's really the most important lesson in the entire course. Richard Romelt, uh, the author of The Perils of Bad Strategy, in his book, The Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, of which The Perils of Bad Strategy is sort of an excerpt, says the following. Good strategy requires leaders who are willing and able to say no to a wide variety of actions and interests. Strategy is at least as much about what an organization does not do as it is about what it does. And the idea here, and I would also, a much less visible scholar than either of these two. There's an article, and I, and I is a book, actually, that I have called Strategy in the Fat Smoker. Right? And I've mentioned this to some of you before. And this sort of highlights this. And I'm sure nobody else in the world bought this book except me. right? Um, but the title, like, Strategy in the Fat Smoker, who would? I think there's an article. You probably Google it. There's an article. But the basic idea is this. is that look, strategy is not necessarily as hard to understand as this hard to do. In the article strategy in the Fat Smoker says, look, if you know, basically the idea of, do you think if you walked out of your office and today and you saw a gentleman standing out there, fat guy smoking a, smoking a cigarette, that you'd say, you know what, I'm gonna make that person's day. I'm gonna walk over there and say, you know what, sir, you know, you really could prolong your, your life, have a, have a longer life and a higher quality life if you would just exercise, eat well, and stop smoking. And you think that person's going to go, wow, what a great insight. I'm glad you said it. No, that fat smoker knows exactly what he or she needs to do to be healthy. But it's a hard choice to make. They don't want to say no to the cigarettes. They don't want to say no 
to sitting on the couch and watching football. They don't want to say no to the extra piece of pie or that bacon at breakfast or whatever it might be, right? So just like the fat smoker has trouble saying no to the things that are ultimately he or she knows are hurting him or her, the same thing with strategy. Strategy is really about saying no, right? Which is why you know it's easier. People like strategy as vision or mission or goals or objectives better because it's easier. But that's not strategy. Strategy is about saying no. And in particular, what we're talking about saying no is about trade-offs. So what is a trade-off? A trade-off is some sort of incompatibility, conflict, or mismatch of some kind. You know, across strategic positions. Right? Think about the balance of advantages, right? You've got to, you, know, you can't be uh, high quality and the highest quality and the lowest cost, or the the most advanced research and the most advi- applied research. There's a incompatibility or conflict or mismatch across strategic positions, or between scope choices, or among activity choices. Right? Why do these? From what are the sources of these trade-offs? Well. Porter talks about a few of them, and, and, and let me give some insights, some examples about each of them. He actually, I think he he describes three, but you know, I'm going to actually list four that I'll sort of cover here. One is just the idea of that you know, given two different positions, the optimal product or service is you know they are incompatible. Right? Think about the idea of you know McDonald's hamburgers, right, and the locavore vegetarian. Locavore is a word I just learned today, actually. Um, and then we're, when I added it to the slide, uh, somebody who likes to buy local, right? You know, you want to buy your locally produced f- foods, vegetarian, vegan, whatever. You know, in the end, McDonald's, the product or service that McDonald's wants to provide for other reasons in the strategy, just not going to be what that local for vegetarian wants. Or just simply, there's, tra- so there's trade-offs against across positions here or across, you know, customer scope choices here based on what the optimal product or service will be to serve different segments. It could be inconsistencies in image or reputation. Right? Think about, the, here's a conflict in Ferrari and minivan. So what would happen to the Ferrari image if they produced a minivan? Or who would buy a Ferrari minivan anyway? Right? I always wondered about, even when you see some of the BMW or Mercedes, you know, um, I guess... You know, smaller SUVs or whatever, or practically minivans, but you know, are, are an issue. I can't imagine if they actually produced, you know, a Ferrari produce, actually produced a minivan. Clearly, there's a conflict there. It would confuse customers, it would confuse employees, it would con- confuse suppliers, etc. If you had a choice that was so incompatible with your image or reputation. There's also a difference in the optimal configuration of activities. Forget about the end product, but just simply how you would provide it, you know, depending upon different scope choices or different positions, right? Think about Edward Jones, who serves the individual conservative investor, you know, and everything's designed around that. And the hedge fund day trader who comes in, you know, wants to trade online and, you know, complex derivatives and things like that, you know, um, the Edward Jones could do it, I suppose. But the configuration of activities of Edward Jones is completely incompatible with the needs of a hedge fund day, tra- day trader. Okay. There could be also just basic limits on internal coordination, motivation, and control. When you do a lot of different things, how do you coordinate them when they have maybe different objectives, different products, different ways of doing things? How you know how do you you know do that right? And just this general. So, so the example here is more general. Just any sort of diversified, very diversified conglomerate. It can be very difficult for them to offer tailored niche service, you know, um, when they have so many different things going on. And at that point, it's, it's, it's almost the idea of the difficulty of, 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 of simply maintaining the same focus, the same strategy, the same, you know, th- th- that employees and managers know what to say no to and what to say yes to when those answers are different for different parts of the organization. So these are sort of the ideas of why you want to trade us across positions, across scope choices, across activity choices. And ultimately what we're going to do now is what I want to show you is that, look, trade-offs really drives, you know, or underpins the issue of balance advantages or strategic scope or for internal alignment or barriers to imitation or strategy identification. All of these, you know, trade-offs is underlies or drives each of these, right? 
And ultimately, the conclusion is going to be that trade-offs really are the keystone of strategy. So let's talk about trade-offs and the balance of advantages. Okay, so remember, let's go back to our diagram of the balance of advantages, right? The idea, we said strategic positioning is about choosing a unique point along the productivity frontier, okay? But what is the productivity frontier? Its productivity frontier is sort of demonstrated. There's an inherent trade-off between advantages that you cannot... When you're along the, along the frontier, you cannot increase one advantage without, you can't get stronger in one area without getting weaker in the other, right? That's what we're saying. So strategic positioning is about choosing where you want to be along the productivity frontier. Well, then another way of describing that is that it's about choosing how weak to be in one advantage or to be strong in another advantage, right? How much, you know, as you move or as you choose that unique position, suppose you're looking at position, a position, you know, at this part of, of the you know, top part here of the of the productivity frontier or down here, what you're really saying is if you want to move in one direction, you're saying, well, I'm giving up the trade-off. I'm choosing to be weak in one advantage in order to be strong in another. Right? So trade-offs are inherent in this notion we've already talked about, balance of advantages. You know, basically the idea is, you know, of course, any in, along the productivity frontier, you know, any any action increase one advantage is going to decrease the other. Right? But the key question, of course, is, so when you say, okay, well, well, do we want to do that? Do we want to get better in one area in order to get weaker in another? Well, do the benefits outweigh the sacrifice, right? One is paying costs. It's kind of easy. The idea is you, if you, if you increase your willingness, if you do something that increases the willingness to pay by a dollar per unit, but raises your cost by $2 per unit, you've actually just reduced your gap to most paying costs. So that doesn't make sense. Or to lower, if you're, something lowers your cost by a dollar per unit, but raises, but lowers your willingness to pay by $2 per unit. But if it's the other way around, if the benefits do outweigh the sacrifice, you can raise your willingness to pay by $2 and only raise your cost by a dollar, then you've raised the gap. You've, you've increased the value you can create. And that may make sense. right? But you also have to ask yourself, are competitors willing and able to make the same sacrifice? Right? So if it, you know, it might, if it makes sense for everybody to do, Right? Then it's not really part of strategy. It's about operational effectiveness. But the idea is that is is there a way that we can do it? We make that choice. We can increase willingness to pay for our target customers, right? And without a you know an equal or greater increase in cost. But that other organizations will do the same analysis and they'll realize well if we do that, it won't won't it'll raise willingness to pay among our target customers you know by less than it will raise cost. Right. So the idea is. You know, ultimately, to, to have a unique, a truly unique, sustainable position, it's got to be not only the benefits that weigh the sacrifice for you, but that they don't necessarily weigh the sacrifice for other organizations. So other organizations will not make the same choice. So that's how trade-offs underpin this idea of balance of advantages. What about strategic scope? Okay. Well, let's go back to scope. Right? Think about this was the diagram, the simple, you know, clip art sort of depiction of scope that I gave you. Right? Well, look, there's a lot of X's on here. You're choosing to say no to a lot of things. That's the trade-off. You're saying no to certain pocket services. You're saying no to certain channels or locations. You're saying no to certain customers or users. Right? I mean, I think the, the scope choice is often the source of trade-off. In fact, I think it's more obvious, right? You know, you're choosing to forego or at least de-emphasize, right? You know, certain products, service, customers, or locations. Right? And from last week, we have a good example of a scope choice involving lots of trade-offs with cores and uh, you know from last week back in 77 back in the 70s and 60s when they were very successful they chose not to serve the east not to produce multiple products etc they were choosing to clearly choosing to make trade-offs in their products in their locations their access or distribution right um uh it, based on their scope choice, so their scope choice was a was a source of trade-offs for cores. Now, not only does scope choice often involve a trade-off, it actually has to involve a trade-off. And this is actually an important point, right? And I'll, so first I'll repeat it and then I'll explain it. In order to be optimal, your choice of scope must involve a trade-off of some kind. Why? Okay. Well, the idea is suppose there was no trade-off, right? That your scope choice, your particular, you've chosen to focus on this particular segment of customers, right? And if there wasn't a trade-off between you doing that and you serving a broader scope or different scope choice, then what you're doing is you, first of all, you'd be leaving money on the table in some sense, right? You could, if there was no trade-off, if you're serv serving, you know, there are customers, different types of customers, say A, B, C, and D and you're choosing to serve customer A, 
But it turns out you could serve customer B with the same activity system the same way you wouldn't have any trade-offs. Then by only serving A, you are hurting yourself. Or you're certainly leaving opportunities on the table. You, mu you, you should expand your scope to B, right? Um, and, and without any real big loss. Think about maybe, you know, Amazon.com. And of course, the, you know, the idea of initially starting off selling just books and expanding then to sell DVDs and CDs. Later on, they get a little far out there with Amazon.com. But the process for, and the activity system and the marketing and everything that goes into being an online bookseller is not that different than being an online DVD seller. Right? Um, and so you certainly can understand that, that, by they, that Amazon could increase its scope without facing much trade-offs in that regard. But also, suppose, you know, the idea is, suppose you said, you know what, I just want to serve customer A. If there wasn't a trade-off between serving customer A and customer B, then if there's somebody out there serving customer B now, they could say, well, you know what, we want to serve customer A. You know, we, we see no trade-offs between serving B and A, and they could come into your scope, not face trade-offs, compete with you, have greater economies of scale and scope. They're doing, I mean, so the idea is, again, you not only are you leaving money on the table, but you're leaving yourself open to competition. Right? So in other words, not only do our is, is, is scope choices often the source of trade-offs, a scope choice to be optimal must involve some sort of trade-off relative to a different scope choice. And, and here's an example. This is actually the Edward Jones strategy statement from the reading. Right? Um, you know, th these are very small type here. I'm not going to read this to you. Don't expect you to read it to you. Right? Mm -hmm. But what I have done, what I did do is actually went in and I highlighted, you know, and actually, actually, I think I highlighted with the all the knots in their strategy statement. Right. So they're basically saying, here's a basic strategy statement. They have their objective. They have the, you know, they have their scope and they have their advantage. Right. But they're saying. Even their target segment is conservative individual investors who delegate their financial decisions. And then they go through and what they mean by conservative, what they mean by neutral, what does it mean? What does it mean that we serve the we have conservative investors, individual investors? What does it mean be, who delegate their financial decisions? And you see all the things they not do. We do not sell penny stocks. We do not serve day traders. We do not advise institutional investors. We do not segment according to wealth, age, or other demographics. We do not seek to offer services such as checking accounts. You know, we do not target self-directed do-it-yourselfers. All of these things that they do not do. So what happens is the strategy statement, here the Edward Jones, remember this is from the article, Can You Say What Your Strategy Is? And about what the elements of the strategy statement is. Here is an example of the strategy statement not only describes what the organization will do, but places even greater emphasis on what the organization will not do. The strategy is very much saying, look, here is what we do not do. That's what's essential to the strategy. It's saying this is our scope. This is not our scope. This is the, the scope beyond which we do not go. And here's an, one of their advertisements. So it shows a guy with a tattoo, you know, and it says, it says, I love Jenny, but Jenny's crossed off. And Sarah, Sarah's crossed off. Jean, Jean is crossed off. Natalie, right? Of course, this doesn't make much sense to, to you know, uh, keep tattooing your girlfriend's arm, your name on your arm if you're going to keep changing it. And they say constantly trading stock doesn't make much sense either, right? Um, and you get an idea of their positioning. The heart of Edward Jones' strategy is about not serving certain customers and not providing certain services. That is their scope choices. You know, Edward Jones consciously, their strategy is about limiting the scope of products, customers, areas that they serve. So that sort of gets the idea of how trade-offs are inherent in this idea of strategic scope choice. So now let's consider how trade-offs drive this notion of internal alignment that we've talked about earlier, but also talked about last week with the course case study. Right? So the idea here is well, now we're talking about trade-offs across activities right? or activity areas. Right? The idea that, that the activities are not independent. Right? That, that what you do in one activity could impact performance, positively or negatively, in another activity, right? But the idea is that if, if one activity affects another, there's a trade-off. So the idea is, as you change something over here, right, you could improve it, but if you change back, that's going to hurt it, right? Or, or, but, but what you do in one activity area A affects how you do in activity area B. Activities can't be independently and individually optimized. You don't say, well, what's the best way to do this in marketing? What's the best way to do distribution? What's the best way to do production? What's the best way to do procurement? No, it depends, right? Because they can't, they are not independent. That's the idea of trade-offs across activities. So there's there's no one best way to perform functions, right? The idea is that what's the what's the best marketing? Well, the answer is depends. It depends on what you're doing in other areas, 
right? And so, so in, in, in the end, what it means is the optimal, that's why we made the list, for example, of all the Coors choices and the, the Anheuser-Busch choices and why, you know, the choices that, that Coors made made sense for Coors and the choices that Anheuser-Busch made made sense for Anheuser-Busch. They were both right. Neither was wrong. And so the idea is that that's, you know, the idea of that, that there's no one best way to do a particular activity. It really depends on your overall positioning, you know, your, you know, your, your scope choices, your balance of advantages, and also your other activity choices, right? If there weren't trade-offs, right, then, then every, everybody would want to have the same activity system. And competition is, is completely about operational effectiveness, about who is the best practices in each area, because the idea is you'd, everybody would want to be copying everybody, right? But... When you have trade-offs, the optimal choice in one area depends on others, right? The, like I said, the best activity in one area depends on what you're doing in some other area, right? Um, and, and that really sort of highlights the importance of internal lobby. You don't want to be uh, incurring unnecessary trade-offs, right? But, you know, it's an advantage, as we'll talk about in a second, in terms of imitation or, or potential competition, that, that there are trade-offs if you're, if you, that from others who have, you know, somebody can't imitate you in marketing choice because... They have a different procurement choice, et cetera. And we saw that, you know, the example of, you know, Coors, this idea of trade-offs across activities, right? This activity system was all very tightly aligned. It made sense, right? Um, but it wouldn't have made a lot of sense for, you know, other organizations, other brewers to make the same choices, right? Um, given, you know, this, the, given, you know, their different activity choices in other activity areas. But also, Right, they're trade-offs so that when they go from, they change a marketing choice, like Coors decides to go from one product to many, or from, you know, from regional only to national, right? These linkages mean that there's linkages between the activities, right? And that, that there's, there is a compatibility, right? And if you change one, you, you could have an incompatibility, right? Again, this idea of when they go from regional to national, right, we create, have a problem with, it's an incompatibility with only having one brewery location in Golden, Colorado, right? Go from one product to many, right? You have a, a incompatibility problem, right? With a lot of other other choices in term in terms of your 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 great scale and efficiency, your your high capacity utilization, your minimal advertising, right? Uh, the mystique obviously gets goes away too when you have many products and you're national. Those are the idea of trade-offs across activities. Same thing with Dell. We constructed Dell's activity chain. Activ I'm sorry. We constructed Dell's activity system. Notice, noting that different activity choices involve trade-offs, right? The, the, the decision to do, you wouldn't want to do built-to-stock manufacturing if you had direct, you know, direct sales of higher-end machines. Or we talked about how doing assembly line manufacturing for the cell manufacturing creates a trade-off, right? But the idea is that the trade-offs between activities or, or among the activities within the activity system is highlights the importance of internal alignment. Right? So we see now that again trade-offs are at the core of the balance of advantages about strategic scope, about internal alignment. Now we see trade-offs as barriers to imitation. Now we'll talk about imitation more extensively next week when we talk about the Apple case study and we get into our dynamic analysis module and talk about sustaining advantage. But we have our first glimpse of what it means and to sustain advantage, not just create an advantage, but actually sustain it, right? When in the idea that trade-offs actually create a barrier to imitation, the idea being right that if you have trade-offs across scope choices, then if somebody has a different scope choice, it makes it harder for them to compete with you and imitate or imitate you. If you have trade-offs across activity choices, right, then it also creates a barrier to imitation against those with different activities. Now let's think about different types of imitation. One form of imitation is straddling. The idea of trying to do, two, you know, occupy two positions at once, right? Trying to trying to continue to do what you're doing before. And this is the, you know, the, the, the reading talked about, you know, continental, trying to imitate Southwest with continental light, right? But the idea is that if you're trying to occupy two positions, right, and the optimal activities are different for the different positions, right? The activity system that Southwest has is different than you would be the optimal activity system for a you know, national um, full service carrier, right? Then trying to do both, you're going to end up underperforming at one or both positions. Right? And if you try to straddle, that you're not, you're going to be, if you're underperforming at both, you're going to be vulnerable to, to, you know, focused rivals who choose one position free of those trade-offs. Right? 
Another form of imitation is repositioning. Right? The idea of saying, you know what? Say, say Dell, Compaq, HP said, you know what? I'm sorry, let's suppose Compaq, HP, and IBM said, you know what? Forget about trying to straddle, and, which they did do. They tried to do a little bit of sales through the, retail ch the reseller channel while doing a little bit of direct, but not doing the whole thing and had trouble doing that. But suppose theoretically they said, you know what, let's throw it all out. Let's start from scratch. Let's, let's reposition. Let's move from where we are now. Let's do what Dell is doing. Let's actually go to the direct model completely and abandon what we were doing before and match Dell. Well, the problem is now suddenly, if you wanted to be Dell, right, if IBM or Compact or HP wanted to be Dell, we saw that complex activity system. They would have to match every one of those choices, right? Because the optimal activity, they have to replicate each and every activity, not just selling direct. We saw that selling direct had implications in all these other activity areas, right? So they have to duplicate, they have to do the direct sales. They'd have to have cell manufacturing. They have to have built to order manufacturing. They'd have to have just-in-time inventory management. They'd have to have close monitoring of buyer trend. They'd have to duplicate everything in Dell's activity system. And because that's hard, and, you know, Porter does a little bit of math. He says, look, if there's a 90% chance you get one activity choice right, the odds that you get, you know, two is 90% times 90%. The odds that you get three right is 90% times 90%, 90%, 90%. When you've got to duplicate many different activity choices, the, the, the ending, the probability of actually doing successfully becomes much, much smaller. And here's actually, you know, and Dell seems to recognize this. So here's an interview with a vice chairman of Dell. And so the interviewer asked the following question. What is it about direct sales model? and mass customization that has been difficult for competitors to replicate. And the Dell Vice Chairman, it's not as simple as just having a direct sales force, right? It's not just about just selling direct. It's not as simple as just having mass customization in plant or manufacturing methodology. It's a whole series of things in the value chain from the way we procure, the way we develop a product, the way we order and have inventory levels, and manufacturer and service support. The entire value chain has to work together to make it efficient and effective. And the follow-on question is, well, what is the competition looking at? So many of our competitors are really looking at our business and saying, oh, it's the asset management model, seven days of inventory. That's what we're going to do. Rather than looking at every one of 10 things and replicating those. Right? So again, the idea being that it's, you know, they, seem to, they recognize very clearly that the, the reason, the case study that I would teach about Dell, I used to teach about Dell in this part of the course, was called matching Dell and how difficult it was about IBM, HP, and Compaq to match Dell to try to imitate them because they're trying to imitate parts of a whole. But when when strategic thinking is system thinking, it's the entirety that has to be would have to be replicated. And that can be very, very challenging and impossible to do. Right? And it's the reason why IBM, you know, Compaq, Gateway, they're no longer, you know, selling personal computers. Another example of, of, of how trade-offs create a barrier to imitation is actually based on an, the story of Edward Jones. So why is the, re the reason that the article on Can You Say What a Strategy Is talks about Edward Jones, it's motivated by the fact that there was a case study, and there's a case study that I've taught that many times, about Edward Jones. Right? Well, where did that case study come from? Well, here's the story. So after that 1996 article, What a Strategy, Michael Porter came out, you know, a few years later, I don't know, say 98, I'm not sure exactly when it was, Porter was giving a talk. Um, and he was approached after the talk by John Bachman, who's the managing principal, essentially the CEO, you know, of Edward Jones. And he said, you know, Mr. Porter, you know, I read your article. Here you see this is a memo about, you know, talking about that you sent out to all of the, everybody in Edward Jones. And saying, look, see, I read your article. I sent this memo out to everybody. And I highlighted the fact that, you know, really, you hit on the head exactly what it is that why we're able to be successful. And what it is we do is that we say no, that we consciously choose to make trade-offs, you know, throughout our scope choices and our activity choices, right? And, and I was very, it was it sort of your article crystallized for me, you know, what it is we do. And so here's actually what I've done in the next two slides. I have, you know, just the first page of a multi-page you know, sort of memo that was sent out. But this, what happened was, so John Bachman actually showed this, said, here's the memo that I sent out, you know. And uh, Michael Porter asked John Bachman, said, well, hey, is it all right if I use this memo in my teaching? And John Bachman said, you know what, if I understand your article correctly, 
and what you said in that article and what a strategy. I don't care if you give this memo to the Wall Street Journal. In other words, I don't care if everybody in the world knows exactly what our strategy is. A strategy that involves trade-offs. If you're occupying a unique position and there are trade-offs based on scope choices, activity choices, positioning choices, then even if your competitors knew exactly what you did and there was no mystery to it, they would either be unable or unwilling to imitate you. Right? That's the idea of trade-offs as a barrier to imitation. It does, you don't have to have secrets. Right? Now, you still, by the way, need to keep secrets when it comes to operational effectiveness and certain new best practices, because those are things that everybody wants to duplicate. But it's choices that are really strategic, that involve a trade-off, those do not need to be kept secret. You could have, you know, this is a case study that anybody can, you know, um, the Edward Jones case study has certainly been read by, you know, leaders at, at, at their rivals, at Merrill Lynch and others, right? But why don't they do what Edward Jones does? Because it doesn't make sense for them. They've made so many other different activity choices. They have a different position. If you've got a unique position with, with trade-offs across scope choices, activity choices, and or positioning choices, even if rivals can know exactly what you're doing, they either are unable to imitate you or would be unwilling. It wouldn't be worth it to them to do so. That's the idea of trade-offs as driving barriers to imitation. And then the last thing, of course, then is trade-offs and strategy identification identifying, you know, whether a strategy exists, and if so, what it is. And so, to motivate this, you know, so far we've, we've highlighted a few measures which do help us characterize an organization's strategy. So, we've sort of described a strategy, even without, before we talked about trade-offs, we talked about the balance of advantages and choice of scope. That sort of helps describe a strategy, right? And that is sort of the external sort of position. Right? We talked about the unique tailored activities, about internal coherence and fit. These things sort of about internal alignment, and certainly those do help characterize an organization strategy. But to cap to capture the true essence of a strategy, we have to identify the key trade-offs being made. That is really what ultimately ultimately dictates, you know, or describes the strategy is the trade-offs. Right? Uh, but by implication, if you have no trade-offs in your choices, right, you have no strategy. So here are some quotes. So, so the reality is there is a pervasive and disappointing absence of strategy. So from the from the Can You Save Your Strategy article is, here's what Collis and Ruckstad say, quote, in an astonishing number of organizations, executives, executives, frontline employees, and all those in between are frustrated because no clear strategy exists. Uh, Rommelt says in the article, in Perils About Strategy, too many, organization leaders, too many organizational leaders say they have a strategy when they do not. Or as Porter says, this is actually from a, a interview in that book by Magretta I talked about, the worst strategy mistake, and the most common one, is not having a strategy at all. Most executives think they have a strategy when they really don't. Right? And so the truth is that, you know, when I say strategy identification, in some cases it's just simply confirming that there actually is no strategy. So you're identifying the fact that a strategy doesn't exist. And to make matters worse, though, is that suppose you wanted to look at, well, what do they say their strategy is? What are their public strategy statements? The problem is the public strategy statements rarely reveal the essence, true essence of an organization strategy. Right? You know, they might have a public strategy statement that says something like, you know, quote, it is our strategy to provide everything to everybody and to do so with the highest quality as well as the lowest cost. Right? Um, and well, you know, we're going to be the jack of all trades and master of all trades. Right? Um, and, and I could give you certainly many examples here you know, of, of, of uh, statements like that. And there's some examples in the Good Strategy, Bad Strategy book you know, about that. So when you see a strategy statement like that, well, what do you conclude? Well, if an organization says something like that, then either it's A, reluctant to reveal trade-offs to rivals, customers, investors, public, and the media. Right? You may not want to say, you know, okay, we're the low-cost provider. So we provide crappy, you know, I, uh, I mean, you know, Ikea might not say, you know what, we provide, you know, crappy particle board furniture, it looks good, you know, but it's probably not going to survive a couple moves, but it'll be good enough for your, you know, college dorm or your first apartment for a little while, it'll hold together until your kid turns two, and then, you know, and they're not going to talk about that where they're sacrificing, you know, some things maybe publicly uh, in their annual report. Um, although annual reports, the actual findings of the SEC, you know, you can sort of, they've got to talk about their risk factors, think that. So they may be reluctant to reveal the trade-off. So that said, the problem is, then, if that's true, if you don't, then, then, then where are your frontline employees knowing what your strategy is? You may say, well, I don't really want to let the rivals know, or maybe I don't want the media know. I don't want to really talk too much about 
where I'm making trade-offs. Okay, well then your strategy, you might actually have a strategy, but you're not doing much good if, if even your own employees, you know, don't know what your strategy is, right? Because you're certainly, you know, I'm not going to keep the secret among, you know, hundreds or dozens or thousands of employees, you know, uh, as far as what the true strategy is, if it differs from some public strategy statement. So, uh, I question A, or it could be they don't understand their own strategy, right? I mean, you know, certainly with the idea of cores, we'll talk about cores and the growth trap in a bit, but the idea, there's certainly a suggestion that maybe they didn't realize how expanding nationally and going from one pocket to many pockets, how it's going to screw up their whole activity system, right? So they may not understand their own strategy, right? Or they probably might be operating without a strategy. And, you know, the authors we looked at all concluded that that in many, in far too many cases, or in certainly in many cases, and probably in certainly far too many, that's what's happening. There simply is no strategy. That said, right, we do have tools. The trade-off, the idea of trade-offs gives us a tool to figure out whether there actually is a strategy and indeed what that strategy is. Because if you can identify the trade-offs, right, then you can identify and understand the organization's true strategy. You want to ask questions like, what is the organization not doing? What opportunities has the organization foregone? Right? Um, where do you, you know, and some of them is not either not, not doing, but simply placing lower emphasis on that. So that really, ask those questions, and that really will dictate, tell you what their strategy is, right? Um, but it also lets you figure out, certainly it begs the question, why? Why is the organization doing what it's doing, but not doing what it's not doing? Why isn't Coors a national distributor of beer? Why isn't Coors have more than one product? Why does DARPA not own any of its own labs? Why does, you know, why does IKEA, you know, have, you know, childcare in its store stores, but Ethan Allen wouldn't do that? Why? In these sorts of questions, you can actually figure out what they're doing, what they're not doing, and why? Why? But also this last one, why don't others do the same thing? Right? Strategy's got to be about choices that make sense for you, but not for other organizations. So what I typically do is I, I actually have this is like a template that I give to you know consulting people I consult with or I work with I want to say consulting clients but the truth is I do most most of the quote unquote consulting I do is for free working with different you know organizations within DOD or within the Navy and I say look I said, I said you if you want to either formulate or formulate or identify you know a strategy figure out where you're going to focus so we're going to put a greater emphasis on on you know these things you know, at the expense of these other things. Now, often it's the implicit expense, right? Like I said, many organizations don't explicitly say, yeah, you know, we're giving up, we're not so good at this, we're not so good at this. You know, you know they're going to turn away sales. But there's, you know, they might say, but they know that they're not going to serve that customer or produce that, provide that service or serve that area as well as others will do. And when I see about greater or at the expense of, Everything, of course, is relative. Relative to what? Well, in terms of, you might think about the focus of balancing of conflicting advantages. We're going to put more focus on this advantage and have the trade-off of this advantage, right? But also the choice of scope, right? We talk about services offered, customers, users served, and not served. So you could have focused on this customer, you know, this segment at the expense of this other segment. Those could be the sort of things that fill your left and right. But you also, when you're making comparisons, relative to what? Well, most importantly would be positions, you know, the focus and trade-offs of alternative service providers, right? What are others choosing to do that's different from what we're choosing to do? Right? But sometimes, you know, it's also relevant to your own previous position. The idea is that we're, if you're reformulating strategy, sometimes it's simply we're going to, you know, relative to our old strategy, right? You know, I've, I've, I've worked with organizations who, for example, especially in the defense sector or the public sector, who have had to, you know, they've faced significant budget cuts and they've had to suddenly give up. You know, they, 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 their budget has been cut, you know, from 15 million to 5 million. Well, now guess what? They didn't really have to have a strategy before because 15 million was, more, was enough to pay for everything they could want to do, more than they could want to do. Well, now they've got to focus. And what are they going to focus on and what are they going to give up, right? And so it might be not necessarily even relative to other providers, service providers, but it but also be all, relative to your own previous positions. So if you think about focus and trade-offs at Coors in 77, when they were very successful, right, we, we can sort of fill their, identify core strategy this way. We can say, look, they've chosen, for example, we can go down the list, put a greater emphasis on having a single premium beer, but giving up, the trade-off is they don't have greater product variety. They have a single large brewery. Right? We've already talked about the benefits of that, but the trade-off is they don't have geographically distributed breweries, right, which would reduce transportation costs, you know, mitigate risk, other things. 
they have regional dominance. They're 25% market share in the Western region. But that the, the expense, the, the trade-off or expense of that is they don't have the national presence. They did extensive backward integration, right? They own their own barley, hops, water, all this sort of stuff. Right? Well, but that limits their procurement flexibility. They can't buy from the they can't buy from the best available at the best prices available. They've got to sort of buy for themselves. They do minimal advertising. But at the expense of they could have had you know greater brand exposure if they'd done more advertising. Right? This unique process, not pasteurizing their beer, right? You know, and, 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 and natural fermentation, all that sort of stuff. Well, you know that um, you know, but the, the, what they give up is they don't have a pasteurized product, which would which would be no need for refrigeration, no need for tight distribution control, etc. So, again, this idea of you can identify their strategy by listing. You know, you should, and this so it should be a one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, not necessarily one-to-one. There could be multiple trade-offs, right? But for every area of focus on the left, there's got to be a trade-off on the right. If there isn't, right? For example, suppose you, you, you had something that you listed here as a focus, but you couldn't identify what the trade-off would be on the right, then that's not part of strategy. That's, if, if, if focusing on that does not involve a trade-off, we already talked about that, then it's a suboptimal scope choice, right? Then others can do it. It's operational effectiveness, not strategy. If for it to be a strategic choice, your area of focus must involve a trade-off, you know, in some, uh, some, some, some way, some shape or form. Another example to take, take us outside of the private sector, right? When I first started doing um, executive education uh, for the Navy, I was teaching in programs like the Navy Corporate Business Course, the Navy Senior Leadership Seminar, etc. Um, and the idea, one of the things that was happening, this is, this is a document here dated in 2007. So around that time frame, I was doing these programs. And whereas I would do a session, maybe a half a day or a day on, strat oops, on strategy, during the program, they would, at that time, this new maritime strategy, um, they called it a cooperative strategy for the 21st century sea power between the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard was something new, and they were trying to communicate it out. And, and these were senior Navy leaders um, at these programs, and they were trying to communicate it. And so we'd always have a session um, with about the maritime strategy. But after, either before, usually often it was before I had my session. And so after they were... I was telling them what strategy was all about, I would have a lot of students say, you know what, based on what you said, I don't think the maritime strategy is actually a strategy. I think it's a bunch of fluff. I think it's goals and aspirations and visions, and, you know, but it's not really a strategy. It's a lot of things that we're going to do, but not what we're not going to do. It doesn't identify trade-offs. And what I said was, you know, I said, well, let's figure out. Let's go through. And so I would take the students through an exercise of actually trying to figure out, is it in fact an actual strategy? And I wasn't going to make that judgment, but here's what the students came up with. Right? They said, look, we can identify, you know, certainly areas of greater emphasis and where we think the implicit, if not explicit, expense is of, of, of putting greater focus on that. And they came up with these sorts of, these are some of the things that the students would come up with. Right? You know, their greater emphasis on preventing war at the implicit expense of winning wars. Now, obviously, it's implicit. The Navy's not going to say, and this is the Navy Marine Corps Coast Guard, they're going to say, look, you know, we're going to emphasize preventing war more, and we're not going to be as good at winning wars. Of course they didn't say that, but, you know, it's implicit. Right? Uh, greater emphasis on international cooperation. Okay, well, if you're doing international cooperation for defense, what that means is you're, you're, the, the, the trade-off is national security independence, right? If you didn't, you know, it's not interna it's international cooperation because we're, we're relying to some degree on allies to help us in international in security. Therefore, we're not doing it all on our own. You know, collective security at the expense of self-defense. Interagency cooperation or integration at the expense of in branch independence, doing everything our, our by ourselves. You know, more emphasis on regionally concentrated for, forces as opposed to globally distributed forces, right? Uh, greater emphasis on peacetime engagement as opposed to major combat operations capabilities, right? You know, if we're involved in, you know, doing humanitarian or disaster relief or, you know, other sorts of things, you know, a peacetime engagement as opposed to being out, you know, doing exercises, practicing for major combat operations, right? There's an expense. Soft power versus hard power. These are, again, terms that the students would call it. And there was these ideas that there were these historic core capabilities of the Navy, which were, you know, forward presence, deterrence, sea control, power projection. And the document said, well, now we're also going to add these new capabilities, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, maritime security. Well, now, even though the document doesn't say we're going to not be as good at these other things, well, 
Obviously, that's the case, right? And that's that you're going to get worse at those things. You may be better than you were historically, but every time that the, that a that a fleet or a platform, every minute you spend working on humanitarian assistance, you know, maritime security, any of these sorts of things, right, is a minute you're not spending in these other areas, either practicing or actually instituting, you know, these core capabilities. Right? There's a limited amount of money, time, and manpower. Right? And therefore, the idea is that that so that any greater emphasis of one means less emphasis than the other. Now, again, like I said, these are all implicit. And in the end, you know, if you know, maybe none of this was intended or conscious, in which case it's not a strategy; it's a wish list, right? But to the degree it is a strategy, right? Then what we're saying is that this is what it has to be. You have to be able to have a list of areas of focus and their corresponding areas of trade-off. And we did the same. We had our discussion about this with DARPA, too. Ultimately, identifying DARPA strategy would be about finding the areas of focus and, and the, and the trade-offs. And, and here's a few that were highlighted in our discussions, right? You know, if you're going to focus on, for example, greater emphasis on advanced, long-term, radical innovation, right? The trade-off is that you have a higher risk of technical failure, you know, longer time horizon until you have a return on investment, right? If you have these short-term limits and rapid turnover, which were highlighted as important, you know, keys to their success. Well, what's the expense of that? having people leave every, you know, four or five years? Well, you get a brain drain, right? Sort of the, the knowledge that they've built up is goes away to some degree. You can't retain high performers, right? No matter how much you might like, you know, you're not, we're not going to have a president elected like FDR for four terms. No matter how much you like them, they got term limits, right? Um, and you ultimately sacrifice some organizational continuity. There's upheaval every time people leave. They outsource all their labs and research. I mean, it seems to be a good thing. It works for them, but but that you know means they have less control over the research, less oversight. They don't own anything at the end of the process. They don't really own the infrastructure or the assets. Right? Um, they have this freedom from bureaucracy, which sounds great, but bureaucracy has a purpose. Right? Um, without the bureaucracy is intended to provide oversets, sites, checks and balances. You know, make sure we are fiscally responsible. These sort of things. There's greater risk. Uh, you know, uh, when you get rid of the bureaucracy, of you know, the things that oversight is designed to avoid. So we can sort of identify DARPA strategy by doing a list of focus on one side and and a trade off at others on the other side. And so what we see is we see trade offs again. Like I said, is to summarize this point, trade offs drive balance advantages, they drive strategic scope, they drive internal alignment, they drive barriers to imitation, drive strategy identification, and that's why trade-offs are, in fact, the keystone of strategy. Okay. And to drive this point home, you know, um, I talked about doing this executive education at, you know, with the Navy, and I remember one of the very first times uh, I was at a Navy Corps business course in 2008, and there's Rear Admiral Thomas, um, who was asked the audience, he was there in person, and asked the audience, he said, what is the premier strategy document for our nation? And students in the room said things like, oh, the you know, national security strategy, or the national defense strategy, or people even said the Constitution, or the Declaration of Independence, right? And not that any of those are wrong answers, but his answer was the national budget. Your strategy is what you buy, right? You can say all you want about, um, you know, what's your priority? You know, but put your money where your mouth is. And not, not just your money, I mean your time, your attention, your effort, right? And so it may help to think about strategy in terms of almost a budgeting exercise. Because strategy is about what you do, not what you say, right? That document, that strategy document that your command has sitting on the shelf in a three-ring binder may not be your actual strategy. Because if you're not actually doing that, that's not your strategy. Right? But the idea of budgeting right, and limited budgets really forces strategic decision-making. So the idea is that you've got to choose. You can figure out, identify strategy, characterize strategy by saying, look, where are we putting more funding? Where are we putting less funding? Where are we? That, that is telling us where our focus and where our trade-offs are, and that is telling us what our strategy is. Another way, so, so that, that example, you know, if you think about budgeting, right, that may help you understand the core of strategy and how trade-offs and focus are the core of strategy. Others of you, you know, maybe it's ideas from military strategy. And I used to teach, long before I was ever married to the military or, or working for the military, I would teach ideas of military strategy to drive home to my, you know, traditional MBA students at Harvard Business School, this idea of trade-offs and focus as being at the core strategy. And because in the end, right, you know, here as Klauswitz says, there's no higher and simpler law of strategy than keeping one's forces concentrated. 
or as a Thayer man says, the fundamental object in all military combination is to gain local superiority by concentration. Focus, right? Put put a greater number of your forces in one particular area or one particular at the point of conflict. Or the quote that I think captures it the best here is Frederick the Great. Petty geniuses attempt to hold everything. Wise men hold fast to the most important things. He who preserved everything preserved nothing. You've got to choose to focus, and you've got to choose by implication to have a trade-off. You're going to be stronger in one area and therefore weaker in others. That's the basic idea of strategy. So maybe the budgeting story, maybe the military strategy, you know, uh, quotes help. But maybe always for some people, you know, it's humor that drives the point home. So let's take Dilbert. Right? So Dilbert, as I always sort of said, you can get an MBA just by reading enough Dilbert cartoons. Well, Dilbert, or Scott Adams as it was, seems to understand, you know, and, and have some, poke some fun at the idea of the hardest strategy. And strategy is about what you don't do, right? And Scott Adams understands that, right? So here we have the consultant, Dogbert, giving a presentation on the importance of strategies. And he says, all companies need a strategy so the employees will know what they don't do, right? Because, for example, Here's a company without a strategy, right? And what happens? The phone rings, right? And the employee, because they don't have a strategy, says, oh, what should I do? Okay. But a company with a strategy, and, and they know what they don't do, the phone rings, they answer it, and they say, we don't do that, right? Um, again, an oversimplification, but certainly illustrating this idea of strategy about what you don't do. Um, even better, this is a relatively recent cartoon, at least I only saw it recently, Understand strategy is about commitment, right? So here is a, and I don't even know who this guy is. It must be a newer character in Dilbert, you know, maybe the boss of the pointy-haired boss, right? But he says, our new strategy is to be nimble. To which Dilbert correctly asks the question, is that the same as saying our strategy is to have no strategy? Frustrated, the boss says, just do your job. Uh, can I be nimble instead? Right? And again, this idea of... You know, people feel like because of all the uncertainty, and we'll talk a little more, about, a lot more about this actually in the next module right, on dynamics, um, but because of uncertainty and change and these sorts of things that we've just, you know, we don't want to make commitment because, because you know, we don't want to make, well, obviously you don't make the wrong commitment, right? But the idea is that flexibility never, you know, the, the it's not he who is the most flexible wins, right? Um, it's certainly better to be flexible than make the wrong commitment. But if you're flexible and somebody else makes the right commitment and makes the right choices, they're the ones who are going to succeed. Right? And strategy, therefore, this is the whole idea, and we'll talk more about it next module, but this idea of continuity of strategy. Right? It's not a strategy that's about standing still. Strategy is a path, not a point. Right? But ultimately, you've got strategy is about committing. All right. So... Now leads us to the one last bullet point in the What is Strategy reading, which is the growth trap, right? And, and implica by implication, the failure to choose and this idea of strategic leadership. Some of this, there's some lessons here that are going to carry over, you know, to this idea of continuity and leadership that will carry over to the next module. But let's understand what the major points are here in this last part. So the implications of what we've all sort of said is, look, the downside, now we've talked about scope trade-offs, right? is the idea that, look, it's difficult to transfer and broaden your advantage, right? What you're telling me is you're telling me that, that I can't do A and B well. I can, I've got to choose between doing A or B. So what it means is you can't really broaden your scope and compete optimally in both positions. So in some sense, you've boxed yourself in by choosing a particular scope, which for which there are trade-offs in which you've made the optimal activity choices and et cetera, right? That means that you can't really broaden your scope necessarily, and compete optimally in both positions. And, and, and in general, the idea is, look, we talk about trade-offs being a barrier to imitation, but the same trade-offs that prevent imitation may also prevent you from entering rival segments. So the idea is, look, these guys can't get into your box because they the trade-offs they would face, but you can't get out of the box. Um, that's part of the downside of scope trade-offs, right? Which seems to be, you know, uh, a real big problem, but we can, you know, we do have some solutions, right? And the problem is, okay, so with that said, this pressure to grow is deep and ubiquitous, right? It's everywhere, right? In the private sector, right, capital markets are always expecting you to increase your earnings and, next, you know, and so you've got to do better and better each quarter or whatever. And ultimately, you know, you can't raise the stock price, you know, um, 
if you don't, you know, surprise the market and have greater growth in, you know, uh, cash flow than was expected. In the public sector, we think about things like mission creep or empire building and trying to increase the headcount that I command or the budget that I get. Right? And, and, and these are just these ideas of this tendency to want to grow all the time. Well, the problem, of course, is that when you begin to grow, right, and across these areas, you know, scope choices, for example, expand in ways across things that were that you weren't supposed to do, be able to do that because of trade-offs, right? You know, um, you you end up eroding your advantage, right? And you really blur your position. And this, my eyes are hurting just looking at this blurry picture here. You blur your shooting position, right? And and you don't want to say no to it, right? And you're certainly incentivized. Again, not a word, but well, something that's becoming a word. You're incentivized to want to grow. Right? You sort of ignore, you know, or put blinders on or forget about those trade-offs, right? And you just grow. And if that doesn't go so well, you just grow some more. And this is the growth trap, right? This is the trap. Is that, you know, you're, you're tempted to grab that money or that growth or whatever, right? But the trap is sitting there for you. And Porter describes it, of course, in the reading on what is strategy. But here's actually, uh, from a Porter interview, more recent 2012 interview, where he has the following. He says, look, the pressure to grow is among the greatest threats to strategy. Too often, companies believe any growth is good growth. They have a tendency to add product lines, market segments, or geographies that blur uniqueness, create compromises, reduce fit, and ultimately undermine competitive advantage. And that's the danger. There's a temptation to grow, but they grow in unhealthy ways. Which, of course, begs the question, you know, well, I'm sorry. Let's first give you some examples that we've seen. This, you know, Coors is a good example. So here we have, in 77, we see that Coors has twice, this is the operating income per barrel in 1977 dollars, Twice the operating income barrel of, of, of the other major brewers, right? But by 85, now, you know, they are, uh, they're operating up a barrel. And it looks like, you know, Miller and Heilman aren't doing so well, but, you know, Coors is operating up a barrel is less than half what it was, you know, um, eight years earlier. And now Anadja Bush is looking down on them, right? And what's happened? Well, they went from, you know, it's the growth trap. In 77, they were Western region only, one beer brand only. They made the, the big changes in this time period where they go from Western region only to national distribution. They go from one beer brand to multiple beer brands, right? They grew both geographically and in terms of products, right? In ways that were incompatible with their, their previous scope activity choices in particular, right? And this is course falling gift into the, the growth trap. Let me use an example of Neutrogena. Neutrogena actually in the article, What is Strategy? The article, remember, came out in 1996. And at that time frame, and historically, Neutrogena had made had been successful by making clear tra trade-offs in production, right? You know, they had you know, no skin softeners or deodorants, which were very popular in soap. You know, they had a much more expensive, expensive, slow manufacturing process, right? They were increasing their costs to increase, you know, their quality. They have this basic residue-free, you know, pH-balanced soap, right? Um, Marketing, right? They marketed like a drug, not a soap. Like they would target the dermatologist, not the consumer, right? They had detailers, like they were selling pharmaceuticals, and they and they would they would put ads in medical journals and, and not on TV or very limited advertising on TV, right? They would do their own medical research, you know, and they would go to medical conferences, right? Um, they would they would you know n not do price promotions, right? Um, and in 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 their distribution, right? They focus on drugstores, cosmetics counters, you know, but not really supermarkets or mass merchandisers, things like that. But but the truth is that what's happened over time, what happened since that article came out, right? By the end of the article, by the way, Porter talks about some concerns that Neutrogena is beginning to not, you know, to lose its focus and trade-offs. And in fact, that's what happened. They, they, they fell into the growth trap to some degree. They were acquired by Johnson & Johnson, um, they, you know, the, the new management wanted the growth, right? They shifted away from marketing to doctors and suddenly had, they have TV ads and celebrity, here's Jennifer Gardner, celebrity endorsements, you know, broad distribution through mass merchandisers and supermarkets. And, you know, I'm sure they're available at, you know, Walmart and Target and Safeway and everywhere, you know, and their performance suffered, right? They, they lost market share in their historic market, sort of the soap is medicine sort of target market. Um, dermatologists began to favor other brands like Cetaphil, right? And those other brands would, would, would you know, prosper, right? As, as Neutrogena, you know, fell into the growth trap, 
Right? So here's an example that's straight out of the reading. It's in the reading as an example of uh, an organization that, that in the 1990s was focused, was making trade-offs. But even Porter said, by the, if you read the end, towards the end of their article, he's saying, oh, I've got some concern about Neutrogena. And he was right. It turns out that they, they made bad, some, some choices that uh, allowed them to fall into the growth trap, you know, by now, if you look. Now, let's go back to DARPA then. So the DARPA, the idea is, so what's happening in DARPA? Now, it's not as much, it, it's, 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 I don't know if this is a growth trap per se, but, it, you know, growth, but there's this pressure, this constant pressure sort of to satisfy the customer and the customer's wanting sort of these applied product, you know, they want, you know, results now in the battlefield, you know, and so I asked you about this idea about evaluating DARPA's drift away or shift away from advanced research towards more applied research, right? You know, it's the same sort of different type of growth trap. Um, you know, DARPA's budget has grown, right? And they've gr it's grown, you know, in a way of, but it's grown by pursuing things that are more applied, less advanced, right? Things that come instant, quick results for the customer. And so we had discussion about what do we think? Do we think the more applied research is good? More applied, doing more applied research is bad? There's pros and cons to it, right? And, and again, and, you know, the, the idea being that, look, you know, there, there certainly is some benefit to the applied research, right? We get certainly get immediate results for current problems. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe this isn't necessarily a long-term trend, but right now we, 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 we need more short-term research because of the post-9-11 realities. But maybe we, those who favor DARPA doing more applied research are saying, you know, um, that, that it's just a temporary sort of repositioning. Right? But there's a lot of reasons to worry about it, right? You know, they did, first of all, the system wasn't designed. It's not the optimal organization for short-term applied research. Other organizations are better designed for that, right? That's not what DARPA was designed to do. And so the, the, the way they operate is not necessarily going to be even the best way to... It's not in your interest to ask DARPA to do those things because they're not designed for that, and others are, right? But ultimately also potentially falling behind in these cutting-edge advanced technologies that, that, that are going to be de-emphasized, right? You know, we're no longer creating strategic surprise if we're, you know, doing something that is, you know, short term. It's not surprising; it's expected, right? Um, and, and who would fill that space if, if our DARPA does more applied research? Who's doing the advanced research, right? Um, and ultimately, maybe sacrificing the uniqueness, right? Sacrificing their distinction, their edge, becoming a me too organization, right? Um, and, and 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 as from a national perspective, this could be hurting national basic research that has a defense application, right? Who does this basic research that's going to have the future weapon systems of 20, 30, 40 years from now? Well, the answer is, you know, university researchers, etc. But the basic research is primarily funded by the government. And the biggest funder there is DOD, right? So the idea is that there's, if, if, DARPA and but DOD more generally goes away from this advanced research, right? It's not like you're suddenly going to have, you know, private sector businesses stepping up and doing basic research. We saw that diagram. You know, the, the most advanced research in that positioning diagram was university research funded primarily by government funding. Right? And so there certainly is some suggestion that there's a, that, you know, DARPA's themselves, you know, not, you know, choosing to, make choices or re a position or reposition itself in a way that is not necessarily even maybe in the nation's interest. Again, you know, I see arguments on both sides, right? But there's a danger of the most important thing is to make sure that DARPA maintains its uniqueness, right? If it is still doing something that is unique and occupying a position that others don't do and allowing it to, in fact, create strategic surprise, right? Then, then it's still fulfilling its mission, right? I mean, it, it, DARPA did, in the, in the Vietnam War era, you know, design the M16. That's certainly a very applied. That wasn't an advanced. It wasn't a laser gun, right? It wasn't you know, advanced, you know, a game-changing, you know, earth-shattering innovation, right? And so there have been periods in its history when it's done more applied research, and it's been able to then follow that up with doing, you know, more advanced, you know, um, game-changing research. And so, so again, I don't think we need to worry too much, but we've got to be conscious of this idea. The bigger picture story for the course is to understand, to be conscious of this issue of focus and trade-offs. And don't lose your focus. Don't forego the trade-offs. Don't, don't, you know, don't grow. You know, you know, understand that ultimately being good at one thing means being bad at something else, right? And that strategy is about focus and trade-offs. 
So this, of course, if those are you know, those are examples of the growth trap, how do you actually grow profitably? How can an organization achieve profitable and healthy growth in the presence of trade-offs? Well, because it may seem like you know, you're stuck in that box and you can't go anywhere. Well, the fundamental, you can. There are opportunities for growth. The fundamental principles are the following. What you want to do are things that, and this may sound like semantics, but I'll give you specific examples, deepen or extend your strategic position, but don't broaden and compromise it. Right? So what are some specific recommendations? The first thing is, you know, the idea is that, that can you increase your penetration of your existing market? Can you increase the distinction of your strategy? Yes, add new technologies, features, products, or services, but that are consistent with your existing strategy and activity system. Right? Basically, increase the penetration of the market you already target. So you defined your target customer, your target product, etc. Can you can you increase your penetration of that existing market? Right? If, you've, if you're at 50% share of that target market, can you get to 60, 70, 80% share of that target market? Also, what about expanding the market, right? The idea is that what about instead of, remember we talked about this idea of there's sort of expanding your market share, but also expanding the category, right? You know, you can grow by increasing the category overall, not just your share of that category, right? Are there ways that you can identify opportunities to bring in new customers, new sales, you know, that, you know, others who, who, who might value what you do? But also this, of course, requires better communicating a strategy to those who should value it, right? Particularly in the public sector, right? This happens a lot where... The, whoever funds you might not be those, the users who directly benefit from your services might not be those who fund you. So communicating a strategy is always important, right? And so the idea is that you may be able to, to even if you stay at, say, 50% share of your target, right? If you double that size of your target, you know, so that you or you increase the, the category, not just your share, you're going to grow, even if you don't grow your share. So that's the second recommendation of a way to grow. Third, so generally, look, adopt and adapt innovations, but never just copy. So things will come along. Certain technology innovations will come along, right? And, and if your competitor has a good idea, learn from it, right? Don't ignore it. Learn from it, right? You know, Edward Jones is not unaware of the Internet. They've heard of the Internet. They know what it is. They know what online trading is, right? And, but, but the idea is that you don't necessarily blindly adopt it because everybody's doing it. Don't be a me-too organization. But determine how the idea could be adapted and modified in order to reinforce your strategy or uniqueness. You know, everything that comes along these days is called a disruptive technology. We'll talk about that in the next module. But the truth is a lot of things aren't disruptive. They may have a major impact on your organization, but they ultimately, they don't, they are what we'll ultimately call competence-enhancing innovations, right? They're not competence-destroying, right? They just make it you able to do what you do better, not that, you know, they, they make what you, you are good at doing obsolete. But so figure out how you could maybe adopt it, adapt it to what you do, right? You, you know, if the trend is relevant, yes, do it, but tailor it to your strategy. Another recommendation about you could potentially leverage your existing activity system into additional markets that complement your existing positions, right? It, your activity system may be optimal for new products or services. Your activities may already be tailored to serve new customers. Again, think about the example of Amazon.com going from selling books online to selling DVDs to selling CDs to selling an expanding range of products, right? You know, certainly, you know, the idea is that, that there, there's not much trade-off for them in going from selling just books to selling books and DVDs, to selling books and DVDs and CDs, right? The same activity system, right, is there. So they were able to actually grow, expand their market segments that they serve, right? Ex new markets, right? Because they're they're, you know, they're able to leverage their existing activity system into those new markets. Um, geographically, of course, expand geographically, you know. Uh, but you got to be careful about that. We saw what happened with Coors, right? But the idea is that the same activity system, the same strategic position might be beneficial in other markets. Um, you know, I mean, you know, would it be feasible for In-N-Out Burger to expand, you know, beyond the Western region? You know, um, there are, you know, and there's others expand internationally, right? But there's sort of this, you've got to make sure the growth is consistent with your strategy, right? But ultimately, this does represent some opportunity to leverage or even reinforce your unique position and identity. Now, when you do this, you want to sort of mitigate your growth risk. Right? So there's always this danger that, that if you're not sure about it, right, maybe what you do is serve that new segment, that new market, you know, that you know, produce that new offering with a new standalone unit, standalone business unit, 
you know, because if you have a semi-independent sort of unit, that unit can then tailor its activities, you know, to the new market, you know, without undermining the, you know, the existing system. Um, and this is sort of, we'll talk about the ambidextrous organization in the next module. This idea of, you know, ambidextrous, being able to work with your left hand and your right hand, two, two different things at once, right? And this is a way for an organization to sort of mitigate the potential to uh, straddle and underperform in both areas, is to create some independence between the, the units. And so we'll talk more about that in the next module. All right, so we've covered it. We've covered, you know, all the bullet points here of the What is Strategy article. And we've now covered, of course, the three classes. Comparative Advantage with the MBA program in MPS, the, the reading on creating a competitive advantage. We talked about internal alignment with the ADAF Coors case study and the What is Strategy reading. And now we've talked about focus and trade-offs with the DARPA case study and the readings on the perils of bad strategy and can you say what your strategy is. Right? And, and so I want to step back then and, and, and you know, how does this fit into the so now we've got this model, and how does this fit into the overall course? Remember, I talked about this fact that, you know, look, there, there are these three primary forms of strategic analysis, external, internal, and dynamic analysis, right? And there are these many different frameworks all over the place that sort of seem disjointed, unconnected, as if there's nothing unifying or universal about them, right? And the idea of the way this course is structured is that we teach you strategic thinking, and then tell you that, say, look, and point out that, look, that the type of questions that you're going to ask when you're doing external analysis, internal analysis, or dynamic analysis, are all the same kind. Yes, there's different frameworks, a lot of different frameworks out there. Many that I've talked to you, we've talked about the five forces framework, we've talked about the value net, we've talked about the value chain, we've talked about the activity systems. We've got a lot of different frameworks already, and that's only, and there are dozens of them. Right? But ultimately, what unifies them all is that you're asking the same type of questions. You're asking questions of identification, incentives, information, interdependence, implications. Right? And in the module we just finished, the internal analysis module, right? Um, again, you know, although we, you, you know, let's step back and, and look at what we've learned and see how what we've learned still falls into that idea of asking those types of questions. So, in particular, we've talked about when you're looking at doing internal analysis, right? We've talked about the questions of identification, right? You want to figure out, you know, so they have, you know, identify your focus, advantages, segments, scope, you know, where are you choosing to focus? That's identification, right? You know, what are the trade offs? So identifying focus, identifying trade offs, right? That's the key to identifying strategy. Um, you know, the idea, identifying, then, of course, internally, one of the big identification things externally, it was identifying external interdependencies. Internally, it's about identifying activities, right? Identify the individual activity choices that you're making, different activity areas, right? Identifying what the distinction, what's significant or distinct about each activity area, right? And, and then, you know, here, this idea of focus and trade-offs on a bigger level of positioning, but actually, what are the trade-offs, you know, you know, focus and trade-offs associated with each individual activity area? Your, your idea of what you've chosen to do in this, this activity area, what are the benefits and the costs of that choice you're making? The incentives, right? So now think about this idea of thinking, instead of the incentives of the organization as a whole, think about the idea of performance in each activity area. Performance measured both in terms of, you know, um, uh, cost, you know, and however you measure, you know, however you evaluate uh, performance, what's the objective? What's the what are the implicit objectives of each activity area? How are the what are the costs that are that are incurred by each activity area? What drives that? What makes the cost go up or the performance of activity area go up? Right? And how does that activity, you know, how does the cost and performance in each area change across different scope choices? Do certain products involve greater costs, you know, or greater performance or lower cost, lower performance, to certain customers, etc.? How do the costs and performance vary across scope choices? And what about other organizations? Right, you know, you know, what incentive do other organizations have to imitate your practice in each activity area? So if you identify these distinct and unique activities, then the idea is, okay, well, why won't others do the same thing? That comes down to a question of incentives. What would happen to the performance or costs of other organizations if they imitated what we're doing here? Information, right? Now, certainly, you know, the idea of, you know, that that there that even though this is it's internal analysis. What external, we're talking about positioning, we're talking about willingness to pay, we're talking about cost, you know, what what external information about these things is actually, you know, gathered, right? But 
what information do you have about internally about each activity area? There's this old maxim that says, what you measure is what you're going to get. So what do you measure when you measure performance in the activity area? What is measured? What's reported? Right? And then the idea of what about information sharing across activities? Right? How when you learn in one area, when Dell, how does Dell's you know, direct sales force um, share information with its procurement operations so that it makes sure that it's, you're procuring the inputs that customers are wanting more and more of. Right? This is the idea of information sharing across activity areas. And of course, the fourth eye is interdependence, and this is at the core of strategy, right? And the guys, interdependence between activities and the strategy, between act among activities, you know, the idea of understanding how is each activity aligned with your overall strategy, right? You know, is it, how does it impact? If your positioning is a low cost, how does this activity impact your low cost position or your differentiated position or whatever it might be? So is your activity aligned with the overall strategy? Right? How are the activities areas interact with each other? Right, you know, does one activity area affect can one activity you know choice affect the cost performance of another? Are there ways that doing something enhances or impairs performance? Right, um, how does what's the best choice in marketing depend upon what the best choice in procurement? How does how do the optimal activity choice you know depend upon what the only chosen other areas? Right. And, and generally speaking, are they aligned with each other? Are they mutually reinforcing? Right. We're talking about these ideas. I remember Porter talked about, you know, three levels or three orders of fit. Consistency. Is it aligned with the overall strategy? Are they mutually reinforcing? In other words, you put one and one together. Right. Um, does it create two, or does it create more than two? Are there, is there something that between the two, putting two activities together, is actually creates some synergy, if you will? And the third idea is. is are there is there a way to design one activity so that you do, you need to, you you don't need to do another activity you do less of that right this optimization of effort this substitution and finally implications right you know how can you either maintain enhance or increase you know your internal alignment right how can your activities better support the overall strategy you know are there additional trade offs that to be made that would you allow you to increase performance in serving a particular segment or maybe to increase the barrier to imitation. Are, can your activities be better aligned, better designed to align with each other and be mutually reinforcing? You know, and can better information, both external and internal, be gathered and shared, right? You know, um, to basically facilitate this sort of set of coherent activities, which are the core strategy. And so that is, you know, again the the five eyes as applies we've now learned in the external analysis model. And so we turn to next the dynamic analysis model, right? And dynamic analysis will also be asking the five I questions, but we'll ask them in terms of, you know, the first topic is going to be sustainability. Right? And we'll talk about that in terms of the Apple case study. And Apple, you know, we look at a story of Apple not sustaining its advantage that it had, certainly, in desktop computers or laptop or computers, in personal computers that it, ha that it had, but being able to have a much more sustained advantage when it comes to digital music, you know, uh, smartphones. And we're gonna we have two readings there, and again the idea being that you know to understand what it means to sustain advantage, you know, and what are the advantages and disadvantages that that that, that a leader has in trying to sustain advantage, and then innovation and change, right? You know, talk about the idea of not just sustaining what you have, but when something new comes along, how do you stay ahead? How do you stay on the forefront, right? And and what are the challenges when it comes to innovation and change? And we have a case study on Kodak and digital revolution, or actually I think I've now called it Kodak death by digital, question mark, right? And the reading here is we talked about a little bit about ambidexterity, about designing an organization so that you can both lead evolutionary change, right? gradually sort of change as, you know, your existing business model, but but when something new comes along, you know, and it's more revolutionary change, how do you also maintain leadership there, right? When those two things make require different, different skill sets, and therefore what we call ambidexterity. So that's a dynamic analysis model. That's the end of my presentation of the slide, DARPA slides here. Um, I apologize. That you probably, I'm sure I could tell myself the last half hour or so, um, my voice being in the trail, I began to get slower and more tired, uh, but I made it through. Like as I said, I've been my health has not been the best, um, but I wanted to get this up for you, and I hope it's um, like I said, it took longer than I thought it would to go through all these slides, but I hope it was worth it, right? and I hope you uh, gain benefit from it. So, thank you. The end.